Hello and Happy New Year. You're joined by me, Kavan, from the Aki and Selfish Digital Network here. Now, you're used to our three shows, Sofa Sensei's, Cool Find on Wicked, and Before Our Friends Die. Now, what you're about to hear is a slightly different conversation, but trust me, it's really, really interesting. This conversation is a Jade conversation. Now, Jade stands for Justice, Anti-Racism, Against Discrimination, and the Fight for Its Elimination. This conversation is with Professor Jason Arde. Now, let me set the scene a little bit. Aside from doing the podcast and aside from doing my day job, I'm also the co-chair of the GEM staff network at the University of Northampton. Now, GEM stands for Global Ethnic Majority, and my co-chair is Dr. Marcella Day, who coined the term Jade. These conversations we've had over the course of many years, touching on things like health disparities, um, COVID-19, and lots, lots more. But this conversation is special in many ways because we recorded it, on the podcast network and also because we had a live audience who actually had the opportunity to ask questions as well so it was a very unique setup and i'm very very grateful to professor jason arde for offering his time and being so open with what he spoke to us about the conversation touches on many things his inspiration in academia his progression um, integrity in all you do and autism so there's a huge huge array of things to learn from this conversation and I just hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoyed creating it. You'll notice a few things. First of all, the conversation is about an hour long. Now, 45 minutes in, I mention before our friends die and I mention the special questions we ask all of our guests. That will come next week in a separate episode of Before Our Friends Die. For now, this episode you're about to tune into is the conversation with Jason Arde between myself and Dr. ML Thomas. And then it's the roundtable session where people who are in the audience had the opportunity to ask Jason questions. So this is a fantastic episode. I really hope you enjoy it. We enjoyed making it, like I said. And yeah, without further ado, get stuck in. And if you enjoyed this conversation and if you you know, want to know some more about us, please check out our other episodes. We really would appreciate it if you check them out, like them wherever you're listening to them, uh, follow us, subscribe, all those great things and share it with a friend. That's the main thing. If you could share this show with a friend, that really, really helps us out and helps us grow. And that is the main thing. In 2023, we want to grow. So there you have it. It's been fantastic and see you soon. So hello and welcome to a very, very special episode of Jade Conversations. You're joined by me, Kavan, from the Gemstaff Network. We're also joined by... Me, Imel Thomas, from the Gem Network as well. And we've got a very special guest. So just to set the scene a little bit, there are 155 uh, black professors in the UK out of 23,000 professors across the sector. Um, we're joined by one of the professors today, Professor Jason Arde, Professor of Sociology of Education in the School of Education at the University of Glasgow. It's honestly an honour to have you here. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Uh, how are you doing? Thank you so much. Man. I'm, I'm um, well. Um, feel very, very fortunate to be here and I'm um, looking forward to shaking a leg with all of you. Wicked. I'm going to open up with a very simple question, but often it's complex to answer. Who is Jason Arde? Oh, wow. Um, of all the things I thought I'd be asked, that, that wasn't one of them. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, I, who am I? Um, I'm, a, I'm a black kid from Clapham, South London, um, from a working class background. I um, grew up on a council estate. Um, I, I guess I've been fortunate to have two children, one's 16 and one's seven, going to be eight soon. Um, and I am just a, a normal person that's basically had very modest capabilities and has tried to do the best I could with that, um, with the central premise being that um, as, as, a, as a kid, it was my greatest ambition to do the best I could for as many people as possible. Um, and to dress like Oswald Boateng and Paul Weller, <laughs> which I look like a hot mess today, but normally I dress better than this, I promise. <laughs> Listen, I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even question the outfit, don't worry about that, so don't, no, no problem there at all. Um, so you mentioned about wanting to do the best with people that are around you. How early was that a part of your being? Um, so a, a huge part of my upbringing was um, around charity um, and acts of kindness and, and generosity. And my mum and dad, um, so we grew up in quite a poor background. We were really poor, to be quite honest. Um, but I never sensed, there was never any sense of being poor because my dad always said to me, um, 
when you're poor, you experience something that you never have when you have money. And it's this idea of contentment and being content with small things. So it's something that kind of never left me. And even though my mum and dad were poor, what I noticed as a child was the amount of time they spent supporting, looking after other people, working in homeless shelters, all those types of things. And it had a huge impact on me and my three brothers when you kind of watch that. Um, and probably the most important thing that happened to me was when I was 18 and my mum took me and my brothers to a homeless shelter at Christmas um, and it had quite a profound effect on me. And I met this professor um, who, I, I didn't need him to tell me this, to know this, because I'd already been brought up in this way, but he said to look at me, people think I just made a series of bad choices. Um, but if you can believe it, I, I was a professor once. So I asked him, what's a professor? Because at that time I actually didn't know what one was. Um, and he said, um, you know, I was a professor at the University of Edinburgh and he said, my mm. wife and kids were in a car crash and I lost everything. And basically I became depressed and complete, became completely disassociated with society and I became destitute. And he said, when people look at me, they would never guess that. And he said, the point I'm making is to look at a homeless person, never make the judgment that they made these series of bad choices because we're all two or three months away from being in that situation. And um, I, my brothers left and I stayed that whole Christmas. Um, and I came back and I said to my mum that, um, well, I was really upset actually. And I, and I came back and I said, I'm gonna basically dedicate my life to helping as many people as possible um, and, and set a couple of targets um, in terms of raising money, how I was gonna use my time and the things I would do. So it's really funny because I guess what people know is kind of, the academic side of things, but um, this this isn't everything. Um, and my dad was kind of like, you can't be buried with your books. So it's really important you think about the kind of individual you, you want to be. And, and that was really important to me. And, I, and I, I've tried to use my adult life well and help as many people as I could. So I guess, you know, the thing that's probably more important to me, I think people's academic careers define them um, but it, it does, I would say the very secondary thing, if not maybe third, fourth, fifth mm. in, in my life. Um, I think it's about the impact you have on people and the idea of doing things is like, um, so I'm a Christian, but like there's a really good Islamic proverb that I think is a really good one. And it kind of says that your right hand shouldn't show what your left hand is doing. So I think there's a humility and there's an act and a just generosity and charity that you don't have to, you don't have to when people do things, it's always about, look what I've done, look what I've done. And you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And um, I, I guess like over the years, I've been really fortunate to to meet a lot of amazing people who've fallen the hard times and, and, and I've been able to make a small contribution to, to make their life better. But um, yeah, for, I, I think like one of the best um, quotes ever, and I, and like I do think this person was like a, a living prophet, is um, Bob Marley. And he <laughs> said, um, if you live um, for yourself, you'll live in vain. But if you live for others, you'll live again. And I think like that, you know, that kind of thing is so important. I think there's, there's a selfishness in society that's really celebrated. And I've been very fortunate to have the parents I've had that I've tried to reject that as much as, as possible. And I think any kind of grace that people show me which I'm fortunate to have is, is probably because I, I've not been like that. Um, and I very rarely say I, I'm proud of myself, but it's something I'm proud of because you only really know that when you're placed in situations where you can, where your integrity can be compromised. In 2017, um, I, I was awarded an MBE services charity. Like for me, there's two, there was two things, like there's lots of people that do amazing work and that helped me to get to that point. So if there's a way of acknowledged it, all of them, that'd be the first thing. But the thing that's probably bigger than that is for me, and I don't, I wouldn't judge anyone who, who thinks otherwise, but for me personally, you can't critique empire and do work on race. And in my opinion, and it's just me, I don't I wouldn't judge anyone else that did accept that kind of award. So, um, like, and that's what I mean. There are situations where you, you, you get your integrity compromised and, and you've got, and it's not as black and white as you've got to make a choice. But like, I think you only really know that when you're in those situations. And I remember like politicians emailing me saying, you know, this is a difference between doing after dinner speaking and getting 20,000 pound a night, getting like that. And I was like, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not. And these, and these are like, 
these are politicians that should know better like yeah. on, mm. on the red side of things yeah so not yeah. I'm only talking blue so I, I just I just think like you, you only really know that stuff when you're in there and I guess that upbringing and being surrounded by the people I grew up with as well who I always say they're the most talented and gifted people I know um, and if they're supported in the right ways they're sat here right now you know um, and so you're, you're always mindful of that. You're always mindful of that. That th life is like like that. Al Pacino speech is this game of inches, and like you can get sometimes. You, there's a lot of things you can't. The one thing you cannot compensate for is mother luck, and and, and I think like there's been a lot of times where I've been. My dad says <laughs> the harder you work, the luckier you get. But I, I think like I've been very lucky. Even being sat here now mm. with all of you, I'd consider that to be very lucky. There's so much, so much to unpick there. Um, first of all, y you brought a quote to my mind in terms of ev James Clear said in Atomic Habits, every act is a vote for the type of person you want to be. And I think that really speaks to the integrity you've demonstrated there. Um, really, really encouraging to hear you lead with integrity on that. One of the things I wanted to talk about, because you mentioned about empire, and I wanted to leave this question until later, but we're here now, so I'll talk about <laughs> it. Um, the Queen's death. When that happened, there was a real... So, so let me give you some context. Yeah. The GEM staff network were a collective of staff at the University of Northampton. GEM meaning global ethnic majority. Yeah. Um, the, the Queen, obviously, is a member, is a, member, is a representative you know, of, of the country, of, of the nation, of the... Commonwealth, all those, empire, all those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people came to me, I, I, I lead the communications for the network, and some people came to me and said, are we going to put a statement out about the Queen? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't think we are. I don't want to, I wouldn't yeah. do it in my personal life. I don't feel like doing it as part of GEM is, is right. Again, I, I felt a little bit conflicted. But equally, that's my view. I, I didn't feel aligned with it, but I wouldn't judge someone who did, and yeah. some people did. And representing a network is different to representing myself. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say is I was really conflicted. Yeah. What were your views around that? Because institutions like universities, where we all work in, did release statements and did express some sort of sorrow and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, those, those feelings which sort of boost up a person who, in my opinion, represents a system which is very damaging, very, you know, has a history of years of destruction across the world. How do, how do you navigate that while being in the system that props it up? Yeah, I, do you know what? It's it's a really interesting thing. Um, there's there's two there's two aspects to it, right? The, the first aspect is a very small one. In a percentage, it's about ten percent of it, but it it's fascinating nonetheless. So it had been seventy two years since any of us had seen anything of the like. So the last monarch was her father, and there's a generation of people who've not seen that. Um, all of us here have, haven't seen that before. Yeah. So the pomp and ceremony aspect of it is fascinating. <laughs> if you just have an interest in history yeah. and what that looks like, what, what, what ancient traditions look like 72 years ago brought into the modern context. So that's a very small part of it, seeing that. The, 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 the bigger part of it is that for a lot of particularly, you could argue the Commonwealth, I would say maybe white British people, the Queen represents stability and, and always has done. But I, I think for people of colour, they, they reside in a different world. And I, and I think that I was really surprised with people's reactions to why people of colour may have a, a, a different feeling towards the Queen, given um, how under Commonwealth rule, it's kind of created subjects mm -hmm. and continues to do that. And you can have these kind of visceral images of kind of people behind gates yeah. in Commonwealth countries, you know, and, and the Queen kind of almost like a thousand paces away from them. And, you know, these kind of individuals of colour, Indigenous individuals, black people kind of as, as caged animals almost like, yeah. Here, here's your Queen. You can, you can, you know, and to use her quote, she said she needs to be seen to be believed, which, which is problem, which is problematic. Um, and, even the idea that a lot of countries now are rejecting that. They don't want the Queen or the monarch or King Charles as, as their head of state. Um, I, I, I find it interesting, you know, kind of that people are like, look, 
it's not about so I, i'll give you an example and it's a really um it's a tangential example but it's a very important one so talk sport um for my sins that I, I listen to it right and i spend a lot of time listening to right wing sort of right leaning radio because i'm a really good counter puncher so the easiest way for me to nullify arguments is to understand how right wing people think so i spend a lot of time reading right wing press listening to right wing news when i've got to do something like present to the commons or something like that so that i can basically i can counter punch i i can preempt what these types of people who think in this way are going to say to me. So it's deliberate that I do it. And Trevor Sinclair is the only person of colour who's a presenter um, on TalkSport. Now, when the Queen died, he made a comment on Twitter and basically said, like, the, the Queen represents, you know, uh, a colonial hangover for a lot of black and ethnic minority people. So yeah. that's why they may not have the same feeling towards the Queen as white people. Now, he was subsequently suspended, like vilified, and basically lost his job. Um, he hasn't been back since. It's been like four months. And the, I don't think he is coming back. Wow. Right? And the thing is, like, Simon Jordan was kind of there, kind of, like, vilifying, like, Trevor Sinclair and saying, you know, how dare him say that, all of these things. But he hadn't said anything that was out of canter with pretty much what most of black and ethnic minority Britain think. Now that's not to um, demean what the Queen represents or what she may have achieved in her 72 years, but it's to recognise that her her reign is problematic. And in essence, it, it, it contradicts the idea of egalitarianism, of freedom, of emancipation. Yeah. And it has done that for black and ethnic minority people over her 72 year reign. And the monarchy as a, as a thousand year institution have done that. So... To pretend like that, you know, we, we kind of live in this kind of melancholic state where we, we pretend like that doesn't exist. You know, um, the idea that we could have relatives, children, people, and we're not all seen as equal. So I look at Noah and I think, okay, Noah, Noah's my youngest. And I, and I think, wow, like, you and George are at the same age. But at some point in your life, you will pay for his upkeep. You are not. You are not equals. And when you put it in those literal terms, how's that? How's that fair? How's that even justifiable? So, and if you even mention the R word and you talk about republic, like people, people, people go mad. But yeah. it's kind of like, why? So I guess in terms of the pomp and ceremony, and you know what's the, the irony of me sitting here saying this is, is that if you asked me any question to do with the monarchy over the last hundred years. My friends will joke it'd be Jason's special subject. He could probably answer any question. I don't know why I know a lot about it, because it's not like I studied it in school. It's not like I cared enough to study in school. But for some reason, you realise how much stuff is always in your face. Yeah. Um, so that knowledge is almost like to hand. Whereas in terms of understanding black British history or whatever, I, I, I would say I've genuinely had to learn it. Um, because it isn't always on TV. Yeah. It, it, it is now, but it, it wasn't. Like, you know, and even when you think of like, how kind of, I guess, Prince Charles will say, for example, not Prince King Charles, Charles. King Charles even, yeah. um, <laughs> Prin uh, King Charles even, um, you know, when you take, look at the Prince's Trust, for example, people always use that as an example of how that has worked with urban communities and particularly black and ethnic minority people. But it's also been fantastic at ring fencing black ability. Yeah. And I, you know, I always kind of say like, there's more to us than Prince's Trust stories. Like I would like a lot of those, I would like a lot of the focus actually to, yes, focus on those kind of stories of aspiration, but also focus on kind of black excellence because we're always ring fenced as this, as this project to be sorted. And the Prince's Trust in many ways, like kind of, um, it celebrates that. And I, I don't, I don't always agree with that. I, I think that there is a lot of other black enterprise that isn't celebrated. And I think it suits a narrative to position black and ethnic minority people as somehow being deficit and somehow being given an opportunity and all these things. So I, I, I think, you know, as a one-off spectacle that we probably, we'll probably see it again in our lifetime, to be honest, um, with King Charles, um, maybe with William. It, it was quite remarkable to see. Um, but in terms of what it represents, I, I think that... Um, I think people are entitled to have a bit of dissonance about 
the late queen and the monarchy more generally, I think. I, I, I don't understand why people get so annoyed about that. Thank you. Emil? Yeah, switching up a little bit then, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your success and your kind of journey in HE, because we're the GEM staff network and we obviously have some uh, PhD students here in the room as well. So we'd like to know a little bit about your journey to success and kind of, you know, what we could take away from that as well in terms of our own development in, in academia. Oh, well, that's um, really kind of... Yeah, to <laughs> To be honest, I wouldn't really know where to start. Like, um, uh, it, it's difficult. I, I don't, I don't really like talking about this too much. Um, okay. But I, it, it's an unlikely story, and and I think, I think, part of the reason why maybe people take an interest in what's happened is because it's quite unlikely. So, <clears throat> basically, like, um, just I guess the short version. Like, um, so I'm autistic. So I have um so I have a hybrid of autism, that's what it was called when I was diagnosed at three. Um so I'm Asperger, so I have Asperger syndrome and global development delay. And what it meant is that I learned to speak when I was eleven. I learned to read and write as an adult when I was eighteen. And I guess the headline is that uh, eleven and a half years later from that I got a PhD. Um and and I actually I was a P teacher in a previous life, so ten years ago. And um, my, my, my journey is not one that I, I, I tell people to, to kind of replicate. And the reason why I say that is mm. because like you, you sacrifice a lot of things. So like working, you know, for 10 years, like sleeping two hours a day, I knew I had no natural ability whatsoever. So I knew that basically the one thing I did have was that I could work hard um, and uh, I wanted it really, really badly. Not necessarily for myself, but um, I'd seen how my mum and dad had struggled and, and I really was obsessed with trying to get them to have a good life. Mm -hmm. I felt that if I could do that, my dream was for them to see my daughter turn 18, um, which, which she will be in like less than two years. So, so I was really fixated with that because there was a point where I, I didn't think they were going to make it because especially my dad, my dad was really unwell. So, um... I, I, I guess, you, you know, I did my first degree was in PE, so it, it had nothing to do with what I did. Mm -hmm. My PhD um, is about uh, reflective practice and peer mentoring among student teachers. So I've never looked at my PhD <laughs> since, I, um, since I submitted it in 2015. So when people ask me, like people always presume that I did... Yeah, and it's followed I did, through. Yeah, I did, yeah. I did race, and I, 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 only, I only really studied race from 2015. I, was, I always wanted to do that, but because I knew how the um, system was, mm. I knew that like no one was going to endorse me or support me to do a PhD in race. So trying to explain to people how much things have changed in seven years is mm. insane. But it has. You couldn't seven years ago, you couldn't redo a PhD in race and probably get a job at the end of it. And so at this particular time. I um I, I I was I was doing I had to get my PhD to keep my job, um, and basically I remember this conversation with someone and they said what are you going to do when you now you're finished? I said I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go for it. Like, I think that I could um I, I think that I could do something in race and I, I've got some unique ideas that mm. I haven't really done yet. You know around music and, and racism and, and mental health and racism in higher education and I'm going to go for it and see what happens. And at the place I was working at the time, they were like, well, if you don't want to do stuff on sport, any research time you have got, we're going to take it away from you. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll suffer that consequence. And I had always been brought up to have the courage of my convictions. So I was like, that's fine. And, and just basically, I uh, said to myself that um, I... I don't know, it, it, belief, like, I think it's everything. Mm. And then one of my favourite films is Rocky, and ironically I was watching Rocky yesterday. <laughs> and, um, and, and, it, and he's arguing with Adrian on the beach, and he says, like, like, nothing is real if you don't believe in who you are. And, like, the one thing that I always felt is that I, I, I have no natural gifts. I'm not particularly good at, at like, most things. But the one thing I've got is that I, I'm just willing to give everything I've got. And that, I think, can go a long way. So I, I always kind of had this idea that, like, hard work beats talent, and talent doesn't work hard. Mm. So I knew I wasn't talented, but I knew I worked hard. Yeah. And I knew that because of that, I could maybe go quite far. 
admittedly, if someone had said to me things would have turned out the way they would have done, I wouldn't have guessed that. But fast forward to when I got to um, a freaking state institution, like Durham, but like I had a conversation with someone and then they asked me, like, what do you want to do? Um, what do you what do you want to do two years from now? So at the time I was um I was thirty, I think I was thirty three. I might have been thirty three. I'm thirty seven now, so like I was trying I was trying to work out yeah, so I think yeah. So 2019, and um, they said to me, um, you know, we would love to support you, you know, you're still fairly junior in your career, blah, blah, blah. And I said, um, well, I don't know, I, I think in, um, I think I can, I think I can be an associate professor a year from now. And they were kind of like, well, no, you, you can't. They were really, they were really affronted that I, I'd said this, they were like, no, you can't, because your probation is nine months. Wow. And, um, and actually, to be honest, the way the promotion system works is you can't get promoted in your mm. first year. So um, it would be like two years before that happens. And I said, I, mm, I don't know. I, 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 I just, I just, I just don't quite know what I'm like. And I'm like, yeah, but there's systems and processes in place that can't happen, Jason. And they're getting more and more irate. I was like, oh, we'll see. <laughs> and, and, they, and, and they were really annoyed. But what, what I realised in that situation, which I've always known. Yeah. If I was white and I'd said that, they would have said, like, it's so good that you're showing this ambition, we want to support you. But basically, when I got there, it was like, you should be, like, the subservient house. Like, you should be happy to have this. Mm. That's kind of like, in my mind, like, that's not how I was brought up. Anyway, like, um, less than a year later, um, I was offered a chair at, at another institution. Mm. And... The vice chancellor at Durham at the time was like, "It's no way we're, we're losing you." So he promoted. So they they kept me and they offered me a counter offer. Right. And I got promoted to associate professor. And this particular conversation, the what the one that happened before, the person said to me, "So where do you think realistically you're going to be in two years' time?" And I said, "I I I really believe I could be a professor in two years' time." And they were horrified. They were horrified. Anyway, like I think sixteen months later. I got my chair at Glasgow. Mm. So I guess the point I'm making is that, like, um, the, the thing that's driven all of that is this idea that, like, um, I think karma is quite a big thing. And I think the reason why I got lucky is because there's a lot of things I did in academia to bring people along. So I didn't wait until I became senior. Mm -hmm. I realised that there was this idea of a brotherhood and a sisterhood. That's what everyone said. Mm. I got into academia. I was like, this is like BS. Like, no one helps me. The one thing that people celebrate is individualism. Yeah. Like, that is what is celebrated. And and there's a vanity with that. And I was like, I'm not going to be like that. So, you know, and people would say, you know, oh, you know, this person. And I was like, that's rubbish. Mm. I, I witnessed it in my own eyes. And it was little things. Like, it was very, very little things. I spent so much time studying people, watching YouTube videos, seeing them in person. And... Like, you'd, you'd see all these people, like, fain over these neon gods, and they wouldn't even take the time to ask you how your day had been, mm. or to just take the time to speak with you. They'd come in, and then leave, and they'd be given this five-star treatment, and it disgusted me. All of it disgusted me. Mm. I remember thinking, like, like I, mean, I don't want to swear, but I was like, these are not good people. Um, and they're, they're the purveyors of good taste. They're the ones who talk about like you know quality all these things but i was like they're these people are, they're terrible and i was like i'm not gonna wait and it's things like you'd email them you want to ask them to write a paper with you you just tell them can you explain to me how to do this and i, and I emailed a couple of these people back in 2014 and uh, when i when i started kind of doing better this one particular person emailed me um i don't want to say their name but they're like <laughs> really really well known and then um, and they were like, you know, what you've done is incredible, and I'd love to, you know, I'd love to work with you. You know, so you've got a fantastic body of work. It's about maybe two years ago, and I, um, I, thought, I said to my younger brother, do you know what? So I've looked at this email that's in in 2014, and I said, dear professor, mm. I was like, thank you so much for your email. I'm still awaiting a reply from 2014. This email that I asked. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. And I was like, and and it is my case in point that like. The way these people are, like, you know, it it disgusted me, and I was just like, I'm not gonna be like that. And mm. so, 
I think the reason I was fortunate to even be in this position now is because I think a big part of it is luck. And I think maybe like mother luck smiled down me. And I do think it's because my focus was to bring as many black women along with me as possible, to bring as many people of colour um, along with me as possible and to open up that space, yeah. to democratise that space. And I feel I've been really fortunate to, to have been able to do that. Um, particularly with like Paulette Williams and Chantal Lewis, who are like basically my two heroine heroines, and, um, and and we've managed to create something that's really special. You know, particularly in terms of you know, it, it's never happened before. Government giving eight million pounds to to Earthfest to basically create more PhD um, studentships for Black and Ethnic yeah. minority people, and that was off the back of the work we did. Um, and it's little things like giving people your time, telling people how you know giving people opportunities right mm. on research projects, all those kind of things. And so, you know, I don't, um, it was never about being the best at anything. It was just about doing the best you could to help as many people as you can. And, you know, in a couple of years time, um, there's some amazing people doing amazing stuff. And in a couple of years time, I definitely will want to do something different. And as you should, you should create that space and leave it open for people and let people fill that space. And then when they have their time, yeah, yeah. Then, then you move on, you know, whereas a lot of these people, they hold on to it. Yeah. I'm pleased you mentioned about women as well, you know, um, opening doors for others and, 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 and allowing that, that kind of progression. And I always try to do that with my students, you know, particularly PhD students and, and master's students and things like that. Um, but sometimes you feel discouraged being in an, in an institution where, you know, doors are constantly closed. Um, so, so I hear what you say and I, I acknowledge that you've been really blessed as well and that's really inspirational. Um, but I, I don't know, as a man, and given that you write about intersectionality, do you think men have it e an easier ride than women? Um, yes. And then, um, if I can say this, uh, so by default, yeah, like I think white middle class men, um, they, they, they do have a monopoly on power in, in a way that we all know. Um, it's hard to say this, but it, it is the truth. I, I've I've been really disappointed by women of colour in, in academia, um, and the reason I say that is because um, a lot of women of colour will basically um, sacrifice themselves for the team. So there's a lot of EDI work and a lot of interventions that they put in place um, that actually. Um, men of colour benefit from and I don't seldom do I see many examples of men of colour lifting as they climb mm. um, and 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 that's an observation that's my observation it doesn't mean that it, it's it's gospel or it's universal but that has been my observation which has made me more determined <laughs> to help women of colour because of that um, and it's been disappointing because I think that I don't know, if we go through our history and we look at a lot of movements and a lot of interventions and a lot of things that are mobilised in terms of the dynamics of racial equity, mm. they're often mobilised by women of colour. And I always call it that the champagne moments are taken by men of colour. So the example my mum will always use is Nelson and Winnie Mandela. Mm. So you know, she said to me and my brothers, like, if somebody, like, how can you live in a country? You know, I'd be like, no, yeah. that's my hero. She said, well, yeah. tell me when you go to prison, what happens? I don't know, you have your liberties and freedoms taken away. I was like, oh, right, Jason, remember that? And she said, it's one of me and my brothers. She was like, okay, so how can you liberate a country if you're behind bars for 27 years? It's like, oh, I don't know. Okay, so who do you think was doing that? Yeah. But when history is retold, what's the thing that people focus on? The necklace incident. And they don't actually retell. And even before that incident happened, no one ever gave Winnie Mandela the credit for what she did. So mm -hmm. forget the necklace ex incident. Right? No one actually ever said she carried her and Zinzi carried that whole struggle in, for the entirety that um, that her husband and at the time and, and Zinzi and Zinzi's daughter was her dad was in prison. And I just think it's symptomatic of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It's symptomatic of a lot of things, and it it's something that I've always been quite vocal about um, because yeah I do think men have it easier but I think they have it easier because I think um, 
there's a selfishness that they operate with in a system which, you know, which white people profit from, mm. but a system that celebrates selfishness. Remember, academia is individualism, it is selfishness. And, like, you know, as my dad said to me, the only concept that's colorblind is individualism. Doesn't matter who you are. Like, in your line of work, he said, people are selfish. Not everyone, but people are selfish. Mm. So that's got nothing to do with being black, white. It's got nothing, you know, that's just how, because that's what you're encouraged to be. You're encouraged to be like that. So to reject that is a big thing. And I just feel like, in my personal opinion, the group of people, moreover, that have rejected that individualism has been women of colour. Mm. Um, mm. Thank you. There's so much I want to pick mm. up on in, in, in all of that. Um, you mentioned about hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work. And I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, have you ever faced the, the pressure to sort of overexpose yourself so that people in power notice you and notice your work? Um, and if so, how have, you, how have you navigated that? Because for, I'll speak about my own career. Yeah. I found that, you know, I say yes to a lot of, a lot of opportunities in, in the hopes that, yes, this is an opportunity or lead somewhere. Exposure is great. People know your name, profile, all these great things. But they haven't really led to the tangible rewards yet. And I'm early in my career, so maybe there's time to be had and all of that sort of stuff. But I often feel like, actually, maybe I should pull back on the exposure stuff and work on just what's impactful, you know, long term or that sort of stuff. But I don't really know how to navigate the space. So I'm wondering about your experiences, particularly when you said, you know, uh, you want to be a professor. That's high profile stuff. But is that a matter of getting noticed or is that a matter of just doing the work and hoping someone notice, notices? Yeah, no, that's such a good point. I mean, um, I mean, the general consensus in academia, like the, the biggest thing is like, I think we've moved towards like academic celebrity. And when I say that, it's not enough to kind of write papers and books and stuff like that. It, like people want to be on TV, they want to be on radio. And the easiest way to do that is probably through shameless self-promotion. Now, when I've worked in particular places, they've made it a point to say, you have to have a Twitter account. Now I'm not on social media. I, I have no interest. I never have had any interest in it. Um, just because I don't really like technology. So <laughs> it, I couldn't think of a worse way to use my time. I, I understand its value, but I think one of the things I, I, in academia is that people can build a profile through doing that. And I guess I didn't do I didn't do that, which is why it always fascinates me that people know about anything that I did that I've done because I don't I don't. Um, so to, so one of the easiest ways to get your papers and books cited is to kind of put it through Twitter. So if you do that this thing called allometric, I don't know how it works exactly, but basically more people get a viewing of it and it's more likely to be cited. I've been cited quite a lot in my career, but I've, I don't think I've ever, I've never ever emailed anyone a paper of mine. As in, if people say to me, like, can I borrow it? Like, that's different, but mm. as in, I've never sent it to a mass group of people to like, look at it. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, <laughs> my belief is if, and this is quite simplistic, so it may not be as simple as this. I think if you're good, I don't think you have to tell people how good you are. And mm. I think that a lot of, in academia, that's what a lot of people spend their time doing. Like they, 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 they do that. And I guess, but it, it is different. Like, like there's not a lot to distinguish people nowadays. And the other side of it is that you do need to make yourself distinguishable. And an easy way to do that is to have like, a well-known online profile. So I guess the disingenuity of what I'm saying is that um, while I don't do those things, I, you know, there are a lot of people who do stuff. I didn't ask them to do it, but they'll say, Jason has done brilliant work or I don't know, David Lammy might retweet something I did or whatever. And then you get, you may not have asked for that exposure, but you get it because there are people who are doing these kind of good deeds. Yeah. So yeah, there's a disingenuity in what I'm saying because I guess I've benefited from that in some way, shape or form and it's probably given me opportunities but in terms of chasing it, there's a difference and I, and I wouldn't say I've chased it because I, I'm, I'm quite a, I'm actually quite a private person. I don't really, I don't talk a lot. I mean, you couldn't tell on this, but <laughs> I don't, but I don't, it, I, academics chase it. I don't know how to explain it, but they chase it. Like, and I, I've never, I've never, I've never kind of contacted the BBC and said, hey, like, can you put me on your books? If anything yeah. comes up, call me on, I've never, or Sky, I've, I don't, I've never done that. So, um, 
that's encouraging. That's encouraging because yeah. you do good work and you've been noticed for that good work. So that feels a little bit more meritocratic than spending my weekend trying to craft a LinkedIn post that's going to get engagement and give it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That feels a lot more encouraging. And I think if I look at my own, the way I spend my own energy, I spend my best energy when I'm doing the work. Mm-hmm. I spend my worst energy and feel worse at the end of the day when I've crafted about how I can tell people I've done the work. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a different energy source. It's, it's, yeah, it's draining. But, I mean, I, I, but I get why people do it. Like my, my brothers, uh, like people always say like, Jason, I've, I've seen your LinkedIn. It just says your name on it. I was like, to this day, I don't know who set it up. But I <laughs> so like, um, I, all I know is that there's a picture on there. It says Jason, but I didn't, I didn't set it up. So same with there's a Twitter account that's been set up for me. But I, I never said I don't. Mm. It, I know what it was for. It was for the marathon stuff, the marathon, the charity stuff that did. But like, I, I've never used it. So, um, but I, I, I do understand. Like it. Yeah, and also, by the way, what employers do look for now, if I'm being absolutely honest, that footprint. they look for that footprint yeah. um, in the good way and in the bad way. So look for it in the bad ways. And if you've said anything, we're going we're gonna to nail you for it. And they, but moreover, they look for it in a good way because they're like, if this person has a profile, if we bring this person into the university or into the department, we can use their profile to showcase the work in our department, which would have a bigger reach. And in terms of ref, mm. right. like, impact yeah. is like the biggest thing you can have. So if you've got someone who's got that, so I I probably wouldn't, I might be now, but like two years ago, I might not have been particularly desirable to depart three years ago. I might not have been, because I don't have that footprint, but I guess uh, maybe now it might be different. But like, I, I think it's, in some respects, you're kind of forced to do it. Whereas like, I can't really be forced to do that kind of thing, but I, if I if I had to do it now, I think it'd be very difficult for me to say no, um, because I just think like they're like right, this is part. Of, it's not it's not whether you want to do it or not. Mm. You know, even there's even this, there's job criteria where they write into, like you know, it's a sen- it's desirable that you yeah. have a, a social media footprint. Like I had to write a job spec the other day where HR told me to write that for a post oh. at Glasgow. So it, it's a thing. Mm. So you mentioned um, when you was 18, you went to a homeless shelter and um, you met a professor and you didn't know what a professor was. Yeah. Fast forward now, uh, 20 years later, you are a professor. And I work in academia. I'm not an academic, but I still don't really know what a professor is. Yeah. Like I've, I, I've got friends that are professors, you know, yeah. colleagues, etc. but I still don't really know what it is. So yeah, yeah. Can you, can you answer that for me, please? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's weird. Like um, when when I got my chair, like um, at the time, so this was July, twenty twenty one. It uh, it made me the youngest professor in the UK. Um, I don't want to skip over that. The youngest professor in the UK. Yeah, at the time, it wouldn't be now because I'm, oh, I'm I was thirty seven <laughs> in May. But like maybe maybe I, I I would be I'd still be the youngest black one by quite a way. That's um, but a big no, moment. Not by Can quite we? Away. There's um. <laughs> Professor Professor Carleen Furman, like um, she's um, she's thirty eight and she's a press of social work um, at Durham, and she's brilliant. And obviously, she she became professor for me, so she actually had that that title. But I think about a month, two months for two months, and then um, someone from the Voice got in contact <laughs> with me, and I like, I think uh, you might be. So yeah, it's quite funny because um, she's a good, she's a really she's a colleague that I admire greatly. And um, if I had to define what professor is, they say. Because like, I looked up this when this when when, when it happened, so they say that um, it's it's someone that attains an internationally recognised or world leading body of work or becomes an expert in their area, but basically across an international spectrum. Okay, so that, that's fine. And basically, this idea of kind of like consistently producing world leading work across these two particular platforms, so research and income generation. The second tier of that then becomes leadership, um, citizenship, so things like PhD supervision and then and then teaching. And I guess you basically have to have the perfect blend of all of that with research being at the top of that priority. So you have, to, and that that's basically what it is. But I guess, yeah, and I, in terms of the receipts, I've done those things, but I guess what I want to try and show is that there's more than one way to become a professor. Like, I think people equivalent my age to basically, and that I've done it quickly, and that I had like this straight trajectory in terms, because mm. normally to get a chair at, at, at this age, you probably would have been, um, you would have 
you know, in a PhD studentship, three plus one, you would have had a postdoc. There's a very linear route for someone who ends up in the situation I'm in, but mine couldn't be any more different because yeah, in 2012, I was still a P teacher. Yeah. And actually, to be to be absolutely honest, which is this is fact, um, in 2017, 20, 2018, I was still teaching. I was still teaching PE to undergraduate students. So a lot of the work that I did around race, I did it at night. Um, but my actual day job was that I was like a senior lecturer in PE. So, um, but obviously part of it was building these two different CVs where it was like, right. So people always say to me, like, you do, like, you, well, you do stuff in race or whatever. So this is like 2017. I say, no, mm. I teach PE. I'm like, but you're like everywhere in terms of, I was like, yeah, no, because it's basically my hobby. <laughs> so like um, that I do at night when everyone's asleep because I'm, I'm still trying to get a job where I can do that. So a lot, a lot of the stuff that's, it's, it's been unconventional, but I think, I don't know, like I'm a great believer in like fate and destiny. And, and I think that, I actually think I was, I was, this is what I was meant to do. Like, um, mm. and I think that everybody has some sort of gift and like the one or two that I had, and I only got literally one, but like I, I took it as far as I could. And that actually was that I was good at sport and I was good with people. And I just basically took it as far as I could and it, and it led me to being here. So I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is you never want to get to a point where you could, you should never want to be able to define what a professor is because we should try and work outside of that parameter and it should be able to be defined in a different way you know um and like even this like this is a form of scholarship mm. like you know my best friend um Chantel Lewis like she um she's got a podcast called Surviving Society and and basically like now that is like the most successful academic like podcast um in the UK and and like has like I think maybe like thirty thousand listeners globally. Love and, that. And um and basically like one of the things that she's kind of tried to do with that is to kind of get us to think about academia in a completely different way. And like it it's and I think they're five years in now, over hundred and thirty episodes or whatever. And that's why like listening to stuff like this and listening to what you're doing, it's just it honestly it's like mind blowing. It's just so inspiring because I'm like it's a different way of like engaging and trust me in like two or three years that will this will be part of the criteria to be a professor and it's mm -hmm. great and in three years beyond that they'll be i'm telling you I'm, I'm i'm being serious like the amount of the amount of people who want to be in this position like you, you have no idea like they'd be they'd want to be in front of because the vanity of it is oh, I yeah. want to be, mm -hmm. they, they'd, they'd want the opportunity you know i had no idea i'd be doing this today I feel like I've been crap, to be honest, but like, I, 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 had, I had no idea. To be fair. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> me, me and Emma were fretting yeah. last week, like, um, but, but we got there. And you know what? This has been yeah. really, really eye Are we all right for time, Kate, by the way? We can stay as long as we like. Oh, perfect, because... But Jason does need to be the intro too, and he probably needs some lunch. Yeah, yeah, we'll make. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, we, two things. The only thing me and King Charles have in common is that I never have lunch, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never do. I was fall asleep. I'm useless to do if I eat a meal day. So yeah, that's. that's do you know what? That's really um, pleasing because I've got a few questions. If that's all right, I'll do a few quick fires, break it up a little bit, and then we'll jump straight back in. Is it all right, Emma? Yeah, I was going to say as well. We probably want to. Yeah, see I, I want to open it out. I want to open it out as well. Questions too. Thank you very much for that very personal perspective. My question was really around young children, because having been involved with Saturday School, do you believe that there'll come a time when we won't need them anymore? Uh, no, you'll always need supplementary schools. Um, it's only in the last two years that really like teacher education is kind of being realigned to think about like being excuse me, racially literate and, and developing this type of racial literacy and kind of diversifying the classroom space and kind of bringing in our stories so we can see ourselves represented. Um, and this kind of carousels along, for example, like legislation, like prevent. Mm. So as long as you, do you know what I mean? Like, so you'll always, the, the supplementary school movement has always saved generations of people. So even if we mm. think about the educationally subnormal, Proceed so um, as determined by Bernard Coward, if if not for supplementary school movements, the amount of um, children from the Winross generation that were lost to the British education system, who are now consequently suffering um, in in their fifties and sixties, 
it would be more if not for the supplementary school movement. So you're going to always need to do that because that alternative education is one that has been a real anchor for how black people make sense of being black and particularly being black in Britain and understanding about global diasporas and the impact of that. So you'll, you'll always need them. There's, there is no world that can exist without the black supplementary school movement, in my opinion. Hi, Jason. <laughs> Hi, my name is Patricia. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I've been in academia over the last, I don't know, six years, just come in, and it still feels new. Um, but what I wanted to say is, just started to do research, started, we got a couple of bids for some projects, and they're black projects, so one was about black attainment for black nurses, the other one is about retention for black nurses, and we're starting a um, peer mentoring programme. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is, when we start doing things just for black mm -hmm. students, how do you navigate through when others say, what about me? Nobody said, what about me before? But how do you navigate through and how do you manage as in, you know, how do you manage? That's, that's what I really wanted to ask. It hasn't happened yet, but I like to be prepared because I know that things are yeah. going to start coming. <laughs> yeah. And I just wanted to know how, how you get through. What are some of the things that I need to be thinking about? What are some of the things I need to be doing? What are some of the things that the university needs to be doing from the top down and from the bottom up, really? So yeah. lots of questions in there. So. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I mean, weirdly, I'm from a nursing family. So my mum's a mental health nurse and my younger brother is the lead mental health nurse at Imperial College Hospital. Um, I think one of the things that's um, that that what about me always kind of circulates to um, if, if I'm being honest it, it, it circulates back to arguments around class so it's all it so, so the count is always going to be what about the white working class that's the argument going to situate back to now there's nothing wrong with it going back to that argument it's just that I never understood why they have to be adversarial. So why do they have to be in competition with one another? Yeah. So for example, any time um, discourses or interventions around black aspiration are centred, then it always has to be in comparison with something. So what about this group of people? What about this group of people? Um, whereas when other, you know, if we were centering, for example, the white working class, there, there wouldn't be an argument with what about, what about black and ethnic minority people. So my whole point is they're both equally important, but because we reside in a society that places these intersections within a hierarchy, it means that it has to be competing. And what it also does, it also kind of suggests that black and ethnic minority people somehow don't experience issues around class. And they do, because 71% of the British population consider themselves to be working class. So within that 7%, 4% are black. Okay, so the 2021 census says 7%. So like, um, I think with those issues, it's more a case of kind of emphasizing that as a minority group and as a clear area within British society that needs um, a, a larger presence of black and ethnic minority people in, in nursing. And by the way, there's a, there's a lot of black and ethnic minority nurses but the bigger issue is that they don't actually progress because of because of the institutional processes, institutional racist processes. They don't progress in their careers, so a lot of them actually stagnate on on on, on an average salary of twenty seven thousand pounds for the best part of ten to fifteen years. So they're not made kind of more senior nurses um, and all those kind of things. So that there is a need to bring in more nurses. Um, and, and to focus on those aspects and supporting those nurses and giving them the, I guess, the acumen that's needed so that they're able to progress in their careers and also to challenge the systems that kind of create this glass even for, for nurses in the first place. So I think there's always that rationale that you can give. Um, and like I said, they don't need to be competing. Both of them are of equal importance, but obviously, you know, there's always this narrative. It doesn't have to circle back to anything. You know, um, there is an underrepresentation of black nurses in the UK, and that's an area that needs to be proliferated and explored further. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of a it's a it's a not it's a non argument to kind of circle it back to okay, well, what about us? What about this? Like, th there's a lot of interventions already in place for a lot of people. There isn't actually a lot of interventions 
for black people looking to pursue a trajectory in nursing, in, in nursing to be specific. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Any other questions from around the room? First of all, I want to say thank you very much for coming today. Um, listening to you has been really um, insightful and definitely motivational because I'm on the studentship, um, doing my PhD here. I wanted to ask you, thank you, um, having a disability, um, how did that, how did, how did that either limit you or propel you into doing your um, PhD? And like, what did you learn um, about yourself whilst you were um, studying? Well, that's a great question. I, I mean, I guess the first thing is that I, I don't... Um, I got diagnosed when I was three years old, so I've had it my entire life. Um, so I don't, I don't know any different. So, um, and I was part of a, a social experiment <laughs> called 7-Up. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. And my, yeah, my mum took me out of it when I was thinking about just before I turned 18. But basically, like, um, yeah, I mean, it's for another day, but like, how my life could have turned out and how it's turned out, it's like, it's, it's yeah, it's crazy. But I never, I never saw um, it like that. What I became really fixated on is the idea that, like, it's so improbable, let's try and go for it. So, my, my, the perverseness of the way I think is that the more improbable it is, the more attractive it is to me. So I, I knew that like, okay, what's the likelihood of like, because by the, the, the context to this is that for, for, for I, I, so I learned to read and write as an adult, my daughter's hyperlexic. So Taylor was able to read and write competently before she was two and a half. So there was a point where we were reading and writing the same books. So there's a whole aspect of learning that I don't know. So like, I don't know what a simile is. I don't know how to use a noun properly. I don't know how to use an object, all of those things. So in the end, where, my autism has been a massive advantage is that you learn a way of doing things and you just adapt and the rigidity of that <laughs> means that um, I can follow that and I can do it repetitively and I guess where most people come unstuck is that most people can't do the same thing repetitively because it creates a sense of boredom whereas for me I could do the same thing over and over and over again so my autism proved to be like my biggest advantage in doing stuff and I guess in terms of my PhD, I worked full time as a lecturer and had a part time job. That same has been said, but I, I completed my PhD in two and a half years. So working working full time, and the reason why why I was able to do that one because of the way I think. But actually, it takes on average if you're going to do a PhD full time, it's three to four years funded, right? So that's your main job, and if you want to do it part time, it'd be like five to six years. So I, I killed myself to do it it's because I could do things in such a repetitive way and if I wasn't autistic I genuinely believe that I wouldn't have been able to do that um, because of like like these patterns of and I love repetition so like these patterns and symmetry so like those which is why I love tailoring so much because it's the same repetitive pattern in terms of cutting patterns and the symmetry is that like when you put these parts together what you end up with this amazing garment but like everything is done to absolute precision and it's repetitive so you'll do this maybe six or seven times in a day, cutting out a paper pattern for a suit. And all of those things, I don't know, you bring them all together. I didn't really have any academic ability, mm. but I, I managed to just get over the line. Um, and I guess from that point of view, but I, 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 always, I also knew that I could do it. I, always, I remember thinking, like, if anyone could do something so ridiculous, it'd, it'd be me. I do remember distinctly thinking that. And I think the only person, the only two people who agreed with me was Sandro and my mum. I don't really call her mum, but her name's Gifty. So like every girl named woman's called Gifty. Yes. But okay, <laughs> so I call it, so like I said, Gif, right? I call it Gif. And it's, they were the only two people who just was like, I think this is possible. And, and so that was, that kind of became the focus because I, I knew that once you get a PhD, not that life becomes easy in higher education, but like it, it opens a few more opportunities. Um, and at that time, there still wasn't actually a lot of people f that were around my age who had PhDs. So it did open up a lot of doors, but then by the same token, like um, 
and this is not to put you off, but someone said, so, <laughs> I remember thinking, like, oh, okay, this is it, this is it, like, um, they said, no, 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 the PhD gives you the key to get to stand in front of the door, but like, but then now you've got to open it, so I was like, what happens after that? Because I didn't have any mentorship or anything, so it's like, well, now you've got to write books, papers, but I was like, how do I do it? This is 2015, how do I do that? I don't, what do I do? And they're like, well, that's, 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 that's the game, Jason. And I was like, what if I don't do it? Well, you, you, won't, you, won't keep, you, won't, you won't be able to keep a job because increasingly they're going to say to you, you need to do these things. I'm like, yeah, but what if I don't want, if, I, if I do this, I'm going to have a life. I'm gonna, like, that's just the way the world, Jason. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest lesson I learned. Actually, it was afterwards. And also two days after I got my PhD, uh, they were like, um, a friend was like, oh, you know, are you happy? So like, yeah, you should have got funding. You know, I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, um, like, have you not heard like a PhD studentship? Like you can get paid to do a PhD. So I was like, what? What's that? And they were like, um, you don't know what that is. I was like, no, I don't. They're like they give you like a stipend every month, maybe tax free, like anywhere between thirty and six hundred pounds to do a P. That's your job. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, it's like your job. And like I just sat there, just like I was like, oh, told two tears. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he was like, you didn't know. I was like, no, I, I didn't know. I said, I mean. Have you always known? He's like, yeah. I was like, you do know I'm like thirty thousand pounds in debt, mm. and like he was like, I didn't know you didn't know. I thought you'd do this for a living. How can you not know? But to try and explain to people how that information was not democratized to yeah. black people, yeah. Mm. yeah, seven years ago. Like yeah, honestly, it was. It wasn't even democratized, but it was two years ago, three years ago. It's only in the last two years that more black PhD students have been funded because of the Leaving Roots report. So like, because yeah, there was like twenty three thousand funded students in 2019, but only 30 black students were awarded PhDs. So we were awarded um, PhD funding. That's the, re the report we did. And so as a result, that's where the eight million pound competition. So if you were black in the UK, you were black UK domiciled, the likelihood of you getting PhD funding was like zero. Because you just wouldn't know, the information wasn't there for us to be able to do it. So my friend was laughing that I didn't know, but my friend was like a white person telling me this, who'd had PhD, I was like, you know, how would I know that? How would I know that? So that's how much has changed. So to be sat here with an exceptional black woman saying that, like, I'm a PhD student, and did you say, did you say you're funded? Yeah. Yeah, that, that is about as good as it gets, in my opinion. So you're, you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've got a really short question, is that okay? Um, I'm white. I have no discernible talent like you. I'm also, a, no, it's true. I work hard. I've got a really strong work ethic and I'm a sociologist. So this is like the ultimate oh, yeah. Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and I, I've spent the last probably 10 years in a widely participating institution, hammering home how important it is to give opportunities to all of our students. Um, but in the last few years, particularly black and ethnic minority, mainly black British students, actually, if I'm really honest. And I love being in these spaces. I find them absolutely fascinating and I want to do good things. I'm very white, as you can see. And I think my question to you is, is should I be in this space or shouldn't I be in this space? And I can take that answer, that's fine. But if I stay in the space, what is the most effective thing I can do? Because Kevin and I talk about this quite a lot. What can I do as a white woman to further what I call the cause or, or the project or whatever it might be? Or should I just leave it and leave that space open to, for black women or black men? I'd really like to hear your take on that. No, that's a great question. Like, I mean, the first thing is you stay in the space um, and by staying in the space, you can create space. So I, I think this is just my opinion. I think what comes quite unnaturally to white people is to not be in the driver's seat, so to be a passenger, yeah. and to vacate that seat for a black or brown or ethnic minority or indigenous person to sit in that seat. So I think it's important um, for you to stay in this space. And also what it shows is what I call, a, it, call it shows a seasonal commitment. So when you're a black or ethnic minority person, like racism is like seasonal, you experience it in winter, spring, or summer and autumn. Um, when traditionally what white allyship has resembled is do you know what like you know I've, 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 I've really given them my best in the spring and the summer I'm just going to take the autumn off and the winter to recuperate and then I'll be back in 
And it's like, okay, well, while you do that, yeah. like, still we, we, we've got to face this for four seasons. So actually, by staying in the room, and metaphorically speaking, it, it's a commitment. It's a commitment. And it goes back to something I said earlier on about kind of that Islamic proverb, like your, your right hand should show what your left hand is doing. So a lot of time when kind of white people engage in this work, actually they're very quick to tell people, hey, I, I'm doing this, I'm a really good white ally. It's like, that's not how it works. Like you're still, you're still taking up space by doing that. So it's about creating the space and recognizing that actually you might not be commended or rewarded for that in any way, shape or form. Yeah. But the, the act of creating space is one that doesn't have to be heard, but it will be keenly seen and felt by people of color who, and that appreciation should, should be enough. It doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be aligned to getting promoted or kind of um, getting some honor from the vice chancellor. Like all of these things, like it needs to be intrinsic. And I think you being here and engaging the way you do speaks to like your intrinsic endeavor and motivation. And that is to be massively celebrated and congratulated. But it's that whole thing of like, you know, what, what do you do when, when no one's looking at you, when there's no light on you? you? You kind of really know how honest you are when no one's looking. When, when, when there isn't any lights and there isn't any attention to be gravitated from that, what things do you do to mobilise black people, people come and create that space? And I always think, you know, when I think about what I want to do specifically for women and for people from particular minority groups, I always think a lot of stuff that I do, like, I only know the, the true scale of it by what I do when I'm on my own in terms of the things that I'm doing, you know, in, because those things people can't see and they're not supposed to see them. Um, it's just supposed to happen. And, that, and that's how you know, whereas I think when people do stuff, by and large, they always want people to know what they've done. And I think when white people do stuff in line with race, that's, that's, that's something they always want people to know. Like, hey, look, I'm here, I'm doing it. It's like, well, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Because like, when black and ethnic minority people do things, and no one gives us credit for doing it. Only well, for four seasons now. That's it, yeah, <laughs> and that, that's exactly it. So yeah, that's yeah, the way to go. Cool, thank you. I love that answer. Um, yeah, wow. You're getting my brain ticking. Um, so thank you, first of all, for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Um, last thing I want to touch on, you actually answered a few of my questions that I was going to ask, but the last thing I want to touch on is Union Black. Um, there ain't no black in the, union, in the Union Jack, was something I learned uh, in my early sociology lessons that I was like, oh, okay, that caught my attention. Yeah, Paul Gilroy. Gilroy. Yeah, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, and since then, you know, I've been reading around the subject and then I've been inducted into workplaces and had EDI training, yeah. which I thought, can I say this? I thought, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> I thought it was rubbish. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think it was scratching any side, any of the sides or yeah, any of the surface. Yeah, rubbish. Yeah. But Union Black was the first one that I genuinely left there thinking, okay, if someone else took this, I'd be... I'd be kind of happy. Like every, everything else has been like, if they took this, I wouldn't even pay any mind. If they took Union Black and they spent the time, the additional resources, got engaged in the discussion, watched the videos, really properly interrogated themselves internally, I'd be pleased with it. What are your reflections on Union Black? Obviously, you, you played a part in it. Um, sorry, that sounded like it's a show. No, that's all you, had, you had a role <laughs> to play in Union Black. And uh, yeah, what are your reflections on that? Uh, my reflections on it are that um, Professor... Marcia Wilson and L Lorraine Jones, so they're both based at the OU, um, particularly uh, Professor Marcia Wilson. I always say she's the nicest person in rock and roll. Um, <laughs> that it was her brainchild. And obviously to have these, t these two black women spearhead this, obviously when you come up with ideas for things, you never know how, how big it will be. So yeah. I always think like when they had this idea, they couldn't have foreseen that like Santander would get on board. Like I think they've had over 4 million subscribers to it. It's been insane, like, um, it's been insane, like, uh, and, and it's been like a global thing. It does not just kind of reside to the UK. And obviously I've, I've known Marcia was the, um, the first, I've only ever had two women of colour, two women of colour that were my line managers and Marcia was the first. But Marcia is like the most exceptional person. Like she's just, she's brilliant. Like everything about her, like she's just, it's the way she is with people. It's the way she is with people. Like, you know, there's a lot I learned of her working with her. And, and now I'm fortunate enough to be able to call her a friend. Mm. Um, 
but it, it, it was her idea, like, and, and then obviously Lorraine kind of being involved in it as well, like, the, the inspiration for it was basically there wasn't, they, they felt there wasn't a lot of um, kind of really good uh, black workshops that were kind of designed to front um, front and centre kind of black history mm. um, from a diasporic point of view, from the indi indigeneity point of view, but particularly from a black British history point of view. And I mean, what I don't know if you can tell from the video, but I, I've never actually seen it, believe it or not. So I don't actually know what it, what it looks like, but... But I obviously know the content because we had to write, yeah. to write part of it. But we did it at Brixton Cultural Archives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even doing it there, it was like insane. And I obviously I grew up in Clapham, South London, so I, I know what that in, what that place used to be like. Windrush Square, right? Yeah, and I know, yeah, and I know yeah. what it looks like now. So it was insane kind of doing that. And um just seeing that vision come to life and then kind of, you know, seeing other kind of really inspirational people of colour, particularly black women, um, kind of be part of that space. It was just you, you just really felt at the time you he was part of something um, really special. I felt that, but at that, it was only when it was finished that I, I was told the scale of how big it would be. Because um, if I'm honest, like I don't think about these things too much. Mm. So I, I turn up and and it's not, I don't do that out of disrespect. I do that because um, you don't know what you're going to be presenting to. So it was like, when I was a PE teacher, you, you, you plan these lessons, but like after lunch, when people are wired, that goes out the window because you don't know how, what mood people are going to be. Yeah. So, and I always looked at it like that because you don't know. And a lot of the time I'm presenting to a lot of white people. Now, 30% of the time they can be aggy as in, like, well, why do you think that? Mm. Why do you, 70% mm. of the time they're with you, mm. but there's no point planning what you're going to say because you don't know who you're responding to. Mm. So, um, whereas when I, when I go and speak to black audiences, it's different. It's like a loose jam. Mm. I don't just think I just, I can say like a, a thread and it's like, they'll finish it. They, they know, cause we've all experienced the same thing. Um, and I guess with Union Jack, that's what it felt like. It was like, you just felt really fortunate to kind of be part of something that like, and the, the beauty of it is you didn't know how big it was going to be. You just knew it was special because it was special in its own right. But then afterwards it was like, right. These are like the optics. This is where it's going to. This is how big it's going to be. This is the production. Because also when we got there, I, I there was like camera crews. Make, there was like so much stuff. And I was like, what the hell? What the hell? So I said, Marcia, what's this? She was like, oh, do you not take And I was like, I wish you'd said. Because I, I think I wore some like harem pants and like some like, I was like, I would have, if I knew we were going to be doing this. And she was like, no, no, I didn't tell you because I was like, didn't tell anyone because I wanted people to just kind mm. of, uh, kind of be feel a bit loose about it but I, I feel very very fortunate to be part of that um and it, it was a really really it was an amazing experience not because it was an amazing experience it was an amazing experience to be with such inspirational people of color and yeah to, to for marcia to have thought i might be able to add something if if marcia says you've done good then then that that is about <laughs> as as good a praise as you could probably be given indeed and I've seen Lorraine Jones speak um, outside of Union Black and yeah, really inspirational lady as well. And I hope I hope I get to see Marcia speak at some point as well, because again, those are the sort of role models that I'm just trying to, it's like Thanos, right? I'm trying to collect this, this yeah, hand yeah, of role models, yeah, yeah. just so I can, I can refer to them and say, yeah. do you know what? It can be done. Yeah. Um, so any other questions? I think, I think we're right to, to we'll leave it there. yeah, Thanks to wrap it up much, there. Yeah. Jason, honestly, um, a few reflections, four seasons, um, keep, keep the work up, find your talent. Um, and one thing that, that sprung to mind, I've been trying to put this, this phrase in, in my conversations for a little while. I've, I've seen it and I thought that's really true. We always hear great minds think alike. They don't. They don't. And your network is your net worth. And if you can craft this table of people who think differently to you, like you say, even reading the right wing uh, piece, pieces of the news and, and, and listening to talk sport, just, just to get your mind ticking. I think we're all better for it. So thank you for opening my mind. Thank you for being here mm. as a fellow sociologist as well. This is like a, a dream come true. I never knew you as part of 7up. That is, you're taking me way back to my A-level <laughs> days reading in the textbook there. So <laughs> thank you. Um, Emel, thank you for doing this with me. It's thank been a pleasure much. to work with you and, and the roundtable as well. Thanks for all your questions. If you're interested, this has been recorded by the Aki and Saltfish Digital Network. This is Jade Conversations. We all have, also have other shows on the network, such as Before Our Friends Die. So for Sensei, it's cool, fine, done, wicked if you're interested in music. There we go. I've been Kavan. I've been joined by... Emel Thomas. And... Jason Arde. This has been an amazing experience. Thank you so much, everyone involved. Take care and see you soon.